Okay, we are ready to start another learning objective. We are on learning objective two. Uh, so all the content for learning objective one is done. We're done with all the lectures for that. You have your quiz and interview this week in lab. So just a reminder, when you get to lab this week, you'll be given a link to a quiz. It'll be a uh, Google form with the questions and uh, spots for your answers. Uh, small chance that it won't be specifically Google Forms, but you'll be on a computer uh, file tracing through code and then submitting your answers in paragraph form. For the quiz, hopefully your, all your TAs will remind you this, but you're highly recommended to type up your answers in some text editor outside of Google Forms. Google Forms has a tendency to eat your answers in strange ways since you have a form open that you're taking two hours to fill out. Uh, the the web-based form just uh, doesn't expect that. So uh, you're encouraged to type up your answers in a separate text editor and then paste your answers into the form once you have them all written up. Uh, so you have the form and then during that, while you're taking the quiz, your TA will call you, one of the three TAs in your lab will call you up, say it's interview time, and they'll give you roughly a 10 minute interview asking you about the topics of the course. And uh, you know what we're gonna test is this stuff right here for your interview. Describe the concepts of stack memory, stack frame, variable scoping, and unit testing while reflecting on their importance in the programs you write. For the quiz, I'm gonna give you, uh, you're gonna be given two or three programs, and you're gonna be asked to trace through the execution of that program with a focus on what's going on in stack memory. What stack frames are being created and destroyed and when, uh, variable scoping, which variables are in scope at any given time, uh, and things like that. So explain what's going on in the stack while those things execute, while the program executes the namesake of the learning objective. And of course you're working on pale blue dot if you haven't finished it already. But now we're moving, lecture content is moving away from learning objective one to learning objective two. We're gonna talk about object-oriented programming. This is uh, one of two paradigms that we're gonna learn in this class, object-oriented programming and then functional programming coming up in learning objective three. Uh, this is one common strategy used in software engineering to be able to structure our programs. Again, the focus of the course is what happens when our programs get really large well, object-oriented programming gives us a lot of ways to work with that code base when we do have a lot of code. We're gonna spread out that code through multiple classes as we're gonna to define today and, uh, and have a lot of ways to be able to reuse code that we write in multiple classes. In addition to stack memory, we're gonna start talking about heap memory. Uh, so notice that lecture is going to start getting away from L01, so even if you have lab this Friday, we're gonna introduce heap memory before then in lecture. That doesn't mean you should be talking about heap memory on your quiz or in your interview though. So just uh, making sure that's separated. Uh, your lab this week, that's all last Friday and before, anything we talk about after that. But we will, st is not on that quiz. But we will start talking about heap memory, which is a different type of memory aside from stack memory. And stack and heap memory work together for a more complicated program, especially once we start using object-oriented programming. And you can see the important words that we're gonna learn. Classes, we'll learn today. Inheritance and polymorphism next week. Uh, state, I don't think I explicitly put state pattern on here. But anyway, let's just get into LO2. Oh, right, and project two, I won't go through it. I won't take up lecture time on it, at least not today. Uh, but you can go through the next project. I posted it just a, like an hour ago, I think. Um, but project two is up there. Take a look at the lecture tests, get a feel for what's going on. Uh, there is a big step up in difficulty in this project from project one. Of course, things are gonna get a little more difficult. Um, but this, the way I design my courses, I like that to be the only difficulty increase, the only significant one. Learning objectives two, three, and four should all be roughly the same difficulty. And even, I believe, learning objective four is a little bit easier than two and three. Uh, but one is like an intro, a soft intro, and then four is like a soft outro. Uh, but the middle two, these are tough. So if you're getting overwhelmed by project two, don't be too discouraged. This is like peak difficulty. I don't believe in the linear increasing difficulty throughout a semester. I like for it to increase, level off, and then taper off at the end when all of your courses are kicking your ass. I like to back off a little bit at the end. 
Uh, so my difficulty curves are a little bit different in this class. So keep that in mind, especially lecture tasks five and six on this project are much more difficult than anything that comes before that, uh, before those in this class. So just be prepared for that. Manage your time accordingly. If you're knocking out lecture tasks one through four and you're feeling good and you're like, ah, I'll wait till the deadline for five and six, uh, you're asking for trouble if you do that. So just a heads up on all that. But anyway, let's get into some content. I've talked long enough about announcements. Let's do some content. All right, testing classes demo. I am at the end of these slides. I need to be at the beginning of these slides. Objects and classes. So the lecture task today, the first lecture task of point of sale, uh, we're going to be creating a an item, an item class with a constructor that takes a string and a double representing the description and the price of an item. So if I want to create an item that I'm going to sell in a store, in the project point of sale, we're going to build the point of sale software uh, for a store. If I want to purchase, have an item up for sale, I want a description and a price. At a minimum, that's what I want for an item. So this, these items are going to represent that. They're going to have methods, price, give me the price, description, give me the description, and scanned, which is going to simulate scanning that item, and then time scanned, which tells us how many times the scanned method has been called. So there's a lot of words in there that we don't know, so let's get today's lecture content there, uh, in there, so we know what the hell a class, a constructor, uh, and actually the rest of it we should know, but a class and a constructor are the big things that we need to know. So let's start with objects. We've written a few objects before, the entirety of pale blue dot, that was one big object that you wrote. Uh, so let's recap and expand a little bit on what we know about objects before we can start talking about classes. Objects have two things, state and behavior. State, this is all the variables attached to that object. Any variable in an object is part of its state. And any of the functions, which once a function is part of an object, we call it a method. And so any of the methods define the behavior of that object. How does this object behave? What kind of things can it do? That's the behavior, which is the methods. So state and behavior, or variables and methods. These are the two parts of any object. We haven't really seen an object with state before, because we just haven't needed to yet. So here's an example of an object with state. If we have any variables that are outside of all of the methods, those become part of the object's state. Those variables are attached to that object. So this object has two variables that are part of its state, x and y, and we know that because they're defined outside of any of the methods. If they're defined inside a method, they're what we call a local variable. They'll go on the stack inside a stack frame. They'll be destroyed along with that stack frame. They won't be attached to that object inherently. If the variables are outside of any methods, they're attached to the object, and they'll live longer than the method calls in those stack frames. These are inherently part of that object for the lifetime of that object. Whenever we want to access a state variable, we can use the keyword this, which is going to allow us to access any state or behavior of the object that we're currently in. So we have this method that's part of this object with state. The keyword this is always going to be a reference, which is a word you're going to get sick of hearing from me. I'm going to say reference a lot over the next few weeks. A reference to the object, to the enclosing object, the object that's being, the object through which the method is being called. So in this case, object with state is the method that's being called if double X is being called. Just like you do pale blue dot, dot, some method call, you're calling that through the pale blue dot object. This, in that case, would be a reference to the pale blue dot object. Now, we didn't use any state variables in the pale blue dot object. You might have in your homework, and that's fine. Uh, but it wasn't required for that. Uh, if you do start using state variables, this is a reference to the object, and then we can access the state variables with the dot operator.
quick reminder on variables, I've said this a few times, so I'll gloss over this quick, but if we use var to declare a variable that is a variable, it can change its value. Val is like declaring a const in JavaScript. Uh, that variable cannot change, it is a value, it just stores one single value for its entire lifetime. And we're gonna see a third thing when we start talking about constructors, is why I wanna remind you of that. Uh, these variables that are part of the state of the object, they come by, they go by many, many names. Instance variables, member variables, fields, state variables. All those can be used interchangeably. You'll hear a, probably all of those and more throughout your entire career. In this class, I'm gonna stick with calling them state variables. I think that's the most descriptive name for them. They define the state of the object. Why not call them state variables? So I'll be calling them state variables through in this course. If you see me outside of this course, you see me in another class, uh, I tend to call them fields just because uh, that's what, how, what they were introduced to me as and it just stuck with me. Uh, so if I'm introducing them to you, I wanna call them state variables because I think that's much more descriptive of what they actually are. Fields doesn't mean anything to me, it's just a word that I had to learn and memorize and now it's stuck in my brain. Um, but fields I like to call them, or instance variables sometimes, but state variables, I'm trying to force my brain to always call them state variables, even outside of this class. State variables is much more descriptive of what they are. They define the state of the object, state variable. And if we wanna use these variables or methods or anything with this object, we can use them anywhere in our code where we have access to the object. In Scala, this is any class where we have an import statement, we would say import object with state, or we create another class or object in the, same, uh, in the same package, is that any objects or classes in the same package of each other are implicitly imported, you don't have to import them. Uh, but like in our testing, we have a test package. At the top, in pale blue dot, we have to say import pale blue dot, pale blue dot, dot, closest city, and call that method that way. So this is how we access the behavior in pale blue dot. We can call those methods. We can also access the state variables. If we have any state variables attached to that object, we do the same thing to access the variables. Use this dot operator and access the state and behavior of that object. In this case, we're gonna call double X. When the object was created, which happens right at the import, right at the start of main, right at the start of our program, X was 10. When we call double X, this is a method that doesn't return anything. This is something we're gonna see a lot through object-oriented programming. This is a method that doesn't return anything. It returns unit, doesn't even take any parameters. It seems like a really silly method to write. But what it does is multiplies the current value of the state variable x by two. So it's gonna change the value of this state variable to 20 in this case. And then when we print object with state dot x, it's going to print 20 because we called double x. This is what we call a method with side effects. We call this method specifically for its side effects, which is something that happens, some change of state that has nothing to do with the return value of the method. Uh, these can be controversial. When we get to functional programming, I'll start saying how bad side effects are and how they're the worst thing ever. In object-oriented programming, we kind of live and die by side effects. Uh, so, but this is something we're going to see all throughout learning objective two is side effects, methods with side effects. Some, the, a method that changes the state of the object on which it was called. That's this object, object with state. We're changing the state of this object through this method call that has a side effect that changes the value of its state variable named x. Okay, ahead of my slide. Every value in Scala is an object. Everything we work with in Scala is an object. Everything, everything in Scala. If you're coming from Java, you have primitives and objects. Uh, in Scala, everything's an object. There's no such thing as a primitive. Uh, if you're coming from any other language, you probably haven't really thought about this much. Um, uh, I say Java specifically because Java is a very object-oriented uh, language. It's, it really, the language revolves around object orientation. Uh, but it still has primitives. In Scala it says, nope, everything is an object, absolutely everything. The implication of this is no matter what you have, any value, any variable, anything you have in Scala 
is an object, which means you have the dot operator, which can access the state and behavior of anything in your program. If you type the number five on your keyboard, you have a, a literal int five. You can put dot right after that and access its state and behavior, because it's an object. Everything's an object. Uh, you can access the state and behavior of all these. We've done this a lot with the string class. We've been working with the string class. You've been working with it in pale blue dot. Uh, you can do string dot split. String, whatever string you have is an object with a certain character, uh, sequence of characters. And you have behavior. The state is the sequence of characters for that string. And then the behavior is all the methods that we can call on it. If we do string dot split, the behavior of that method is going to depend on the state of the string, which is what actual characters it represents. And then you're going to get some return object, which is an array of strings, which you can then call more methods on. You can access, call its, uh, call its behavior of accessing the first element, the second element, et cetera. Uh, this dot operator, wherever that appears, that means you're accessing either state or behavior of an object. Even math is an object. You do math.py, you just access part of the state of the math, class, uh, the math object. Everything's an object. So let's talk about classes. Everything's an object, keep that in mind. But we're gonna talk about classes. I'm gonna, and we're gonna, should wonder, why the hell do we need to know about classes if everything's an object? So classes are what we're gonna use to create multiple objects. Classes are like little object factories or object templates that we use to create as many objects as we want based on that template. So we don't work with classes directly, but we use classes to create objects. And since everything's an object, that's what we wanna work with. Classes themselves are even objects. It's kinda of weird the way Scala works, but a class definition is stored in an object which is used to create more objects. It gets strange. It, uh, uh, once you dig deep enough. Uh, but classes are templates that are used to create new objects of the same type. So whenever we write a class, which we're gonna do soon, we're creating a new type in Scala, just like uh, string is a type, int is a type, double is a type. When we write a class, we're creating our own type. Once we have our own type defined through the class, we're gonna create objects of that type and then access and modify that uh, object's state and behavior by using the dot operator, calling, uh, calling its methods, accessing its state, and uh, doing all the cool programming things that we wanna do with them. So let's create a player class. We're gonna have a class that represents a player, like in a game, on a 2D grid. Uh, the player's gonna have an XY location, some maximum number of hit points that doesn't change, so we're thinking Val for that and some current hit points, which is the, you know, the current number of hit points the player has after getting hit, drinking health potions, whatever the player is doing in this game, uh, and some behavior which is going to allow the player to damage other players. So we want to get just a little bit of functionality in this thing, uh, in this game. I'm going to throw all the code at you right here. Hey, we're done. So uh, here's a player class with that uh, specified functionality. So let's break this thing down, go through this piece by piece, and take a look at our first class here. We're gonna look through the entire class, and then after this, I still haven't showed you how to create objects using this class. We're gonna look at that after we go through this definition. So let's take a look at this. The first thing we notice is that we have several state variables. We have four state variables. We see four vales and bars that are outside of all the methods. Uh, the top ones there, the first three, X location, Y location, and max hit points, five, I can't count. Uh, X location, Y location, and max hit points are uh, defined in a different spot. We're gonna talk about that in a second. It's called the constructor. Uh, but we can see that we have five variables that are all going to become state variables of any object of type player. And you can see the vocab starting to build up too here. Uh, we got a bit of vocab here. So we have five state variables that a player is going to have. The X location on the grid, the Y location on the grid, we're gonna find those as doubles so we don't have to be exactly in the center of a tile, we can be like between tiles. Max hit points, which is a veil, not going to change. Current HP, which we initialize to the max hit points. 
and damage dealt, this is going to be like the strength of our attack. Again, a veil, we're gonna assume no power-ups here. And then we have all the methods, this is all the behavior of an object, of an object of type player. Uh, the player can take damage, take some int, that's going to access the object's HP state variable and decrement it by the amount of damage that was taken. So if you want to damage a player in your game, you'll call that player's take damage method with an int of how much damage they should be taking. It's going to modify their state variable by that amount and decrement this HP by, uh, by that amount of damage taken. So we have a method that has defined some behavior which defines how a player takes damage by modifying its state, by modifying that state variable. A attack is a, a little bit more, uh, we're gonna talk about that in another slide, a uh, little bit more going on there. Uh, we're gonna have a state variable that says whether this player is conscious or not. If their HP is greater than zero, return true, else return false and return that Boolean. And then move, we're gonna modify X and Y location by some dx dy. All right, so let's do another pass through that. That was our quick pass. Uh, let's do another pass through this and take a look at this code right at the top here. This player, class player, we're gonna define a class named player and then I have parentheses and what looks like a parameter list, and it is in fact a parameter list. This is going to define a method, a very special method that we call the constructor of the class. So whenever we're going to create a new object of type player using this class, which is a template to create objects, whenever we create an object of type player, we're going to have to give it three arguments, the X location, the Y location, and the max hit points. So we're calling this method, which is going to create three state variables and give them initial values. Anything in the constructor, any values or variables in the constructor are automatically state variables. So if you're coming from pretty much any other language, I don't know, if I'm sure there's other languages that do this, but I, I don't know of any off the top of my head where anything in the constructor automatically becomes a state variable. So these are all variables that are part of objects of this type. If you don't know classes in any other languages, just ignore that what that I just said that. And for you, you're just gonna feel like this is the normal way. Anything in the constructor is going to become a state variable. So to create an object of type player, we have to give it these three and call this constructor method with these three arguments, values for these three parameters. If we use val, the values can't change. I promise this will come back. If we use var, the values can change, but there's actually a third option, when, specifically when we're talking about constructor parameters if we don't use val or var, it's the same as using val, except that those values cannot be accessed from outside of the class. So if we don't use val or var, we can't use those values outside of the class. We can only use them inside the state and behavior of the class, anywhere inside these braces. And we can't access that value anywhere else, anywhere outside of this class. There's one really important place where you're gonna to wanna to access uh, values and variables outside of your class, and that's in your unit testing, among other places. But especially in your unit testing, you're gonna to wanna to access those in some cases. Uh, so if you don't use val or var, and you're wondering why you can't access your values, uh, it's because you have to have either val or var in your constructor to be able to have them uh, visible outside of your class. Then we're gonna use that this keyword, that's a reference to the calling object. Whichever method that object was called from, this is going to be a reference to that object. 
We don't know what references are yet. There's just a lot of stuff that comes all at once with classes. Uh, that's going to have to wait till Wednesday. Uh, but this is going to be a reference where we can access the state and behavior of that object through the keyword this. And finally, let's get to our last piece, this attack method. Uh, there's a, a little bit more going on here. So once we have a class declared, once we define a class, what we've done is actually created a brand new type, some type that did not come with Scala. We define that type through this the constructor state and behavior. We defined a type named player, and now we can use that type anywhere in our code where we can use any other type. So if we want a method that takes an object of that type, like we're doing right here, we're well within our right to do that. If we want a method that returns an object of type player, we can do that too. If we want a value or a variable of type player, well, we can do that too. We can use player, now that we have this class defined, we can use player anywhere that we could use something like int. You want a list of players? Go for it. You have a brand new type that you defined, that you declared, that you decided how, what it does, how it behaves, and what its state is, and how its state changes, and you can use that anywhere in your code. So this attack method, we actually have a parameter of type player. So this is going to be called from a player object, and it's actually going to take a reference to presumably a different player object that it's attacking. So if we want to attack another player, we're going to take a reference to the other player. We're going to call that player's take damage method and deal them damage based on how much damage we can deal. Any questions at, at this point? I, I know it's a lot in this lecture. Introducing classes, there's a lot of things that come immediately. Like I can't talk about classes without this, uh, constructors and uh, new, which we're gonna see on the next slide. Yes? Not quite. So the, the class will be defined the entire class will be defined, the compiler will go through this whole class, define what a player is, and then after the class is defined, then we can start creating objects of it. So we can't get an object of type player before, uh, uh, before the class is defined. Uh, and the compiler, when it comes across this, it will, I guess I don't have a great answer for you on this one, but the compiler will look ahead and realize that this is part of the class that's currently being created. I don't have a great answer except that this is perfectly fine in Scala. In some languages, this could create an issue. Like I, I believe in C++, this is tougher to do. You have to have your .h and define everything beforehand, if that's what you're thinking. Uh, in Scala, uh, uh, it'll look ahead and figure this out. And then we'll never be able to call this method until the entire class has been compiled. So by the time this method is called, player is fully defined. All right, let's see how to use this class. Now that we have that class defined, let's see how to use this class to define, uh, to create new objects. And for that, we're gonna use the new keyword. New, 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 new. So whenever we want to create a new object of type player, we're gonna say new or of any type that we created. New, the name of that type, player in this case, and then that's going to call the constructor. So when we say new player, what we're actually doing is calling the constructor. So we have to give it those three, three arguments to match the three parameters in the constructor of this class. That method is going to be called and it's going to return our object of type player. And then at that point we can do whatever we would do with a player, in this case and in most cases, 
we're going to store it in a variable or value of type player. So I'm going to create two new player objects based on my class, which is a template to create objects. And I'm going to store them in these two values that I created, player one and player two, which are both of type player. I created a brand new type in Scala called player. I can create value, uh, values and variables of that type. I can use that anywhere I would use a type like int or list or double string. Player is another type that's on the same level of all those types we've been using already. It's just a type that we created. So you can create any type you want, create a class that creates a brand new type in Scala that you can use throughout your programs. We can access the behavior. We have them fight each other. And then we can check, uh, we can access their state as well. A lot of your tests for, uh, for point of sale are going to look some similar to this. You're going to create objects. You're going to call their methods, a bunch of methods. And then you're going to access the state and make sure the state is what you would expect it to be after those method calls. Whenever we create an object, those five state variables, whenever we create an object, each object has its own copy of all five of those state variables. So I have player one and player two here. They are completely independent of each other. They have their own set of five state variables. Any changes made to player one isn't going to affect player two in this case, the way we're, we're doing things here. Of course, when we attack, it, you know, player two is attacking player one, then, you know, something that player two is doing is affecting player one. Uh, but it's changing player one's HP. Player two's HP is still going to be 10. It's still its maximum HP. Player one's HP is certainly going to be two after all that. Because all players, I said all players have uh, damage dealing capability of four or attack power of four. Any questions on it? And this is the foundation of, of course, object-oriented programming. Objects are the foundation. Classes are what we use to create those objects. Uh, this is really the foundation of this learning objective. That's why I want to take pauses here and go pretty slow through these slides. Because a lot of content here. There's a lot of new concepts. Objects and classes are really, when you see them for the first time, it's, it's like a whole different way of thinking. So if you have questions, I would love to hear them. And again, I have the, the Discord channel open if you have questions to put in there, if you don't want to raise your hand. Yes. The, yeah, the top line and the bottom line, this is saying that there's code that's excluded just so I can fit it on the slide. Yeah, but up, you know, there would be my imports, the declaration of my main method, uh, an object, there would be all that code. Uh, I'm just cutting it down so I can fit it on the slide. Good question. Ooh, good question. So even though these are veil, they can still change. Yes and no. So veil means whatever stored in that value can never, never, ever change. But what's stored in this value is an object of type player, which we're going to see on Wednesday. It's actually a reference to an object of type player. So when I declare this as veil, 
what it means is that the, ob the variable, the value player one, is always going to refer to the same player. It's never going to be able to refer to a different player, but the player that it refers to, the state of that player can still change. So val doesn't mean that the state of an object can't change, but it does mean that this value is always going to refer to the same object. So I couldn't say something like player one equals player two, which is something we'll see, you know, again, there's a lot coming up soon uh, in Wednesday and Friday's lectures. Uh, we can't say that if it's val, but we can say something like player one dot HP equals three. We can do something like that because I didn't change player one at all. I didn't change what's stored in that val value, but I did change some of the state of the object that's stored in that value. So value doesn't cascade down to all of the state of the object to which it refers. All right, classes, we've seen tons of classes, int, double, boolean, list, array, map. These are all classes, string, I could add to that list. Uh, these are all classes, and we've created objects of these types many times before. If we just did list of two, three, four, we've done this in a lecture slide before, we're creating a new list and calling its constructor, I'll put it in quotes, uh, constructor with the values two, three, and four, which gives us a list with those values two, three, and four. Now the syntax is a little bit different here than the classes that we'll write. Most classes that are built into Scala, we don't use the keyword new. But rest assured, we are doing the same thing. We are creating a new object of type list here and calling a constructor. Uh, it's just set up in a different way where we don't use the keyword new. But we're doing the same thing here. We're creating a new object of type list. We're storing it in a variable of type list and then working with that variable, accessing its state and behavior, calling its methods, uh, doing whatever we wanna do with this list. We don't access any of the state of a list directly, but we do call methods that access its state for us and then returns values. Like dot apply of zero, or, or dot apply of one, or dot head, these are all methods that are looking at the state, find, grabbing some information from the state, and then sending it back to us. Just typing a string, if we say, string uh, bar s of type string equals uh, in quotes hello or something, uh, some string. That's a special way of creating a new object of type string. Uh, but we have some special syntax where we give it the string literal or if we're creating an int and we say five, uh, we're still creating a new object of type int. There's just a little extra syntax there. But we are doing the same thing as we do when we say new player. So we've done this a lot. You've, you've been exposed to this quite a bit, creating objects based on classes. This is the first time it's just being made very explicit where you're creating your own classes and creating objects of your own types. All right, so if I head over to IntelliJ and hopefully we can solidify this a little bit more. So first I want to show the whole example. On the slides, I kind of got it chopped up and uh, you know, I, I can't always fit the full example on the slide. So let's at least take a look at what the full example looks like. This is in the examples repo LO2OP, player class. You'll see the C here, meaning that we have this defined as a class. Our package declaration as before, and then the code as we saw in the slides. Should be unmodified. Exactly as we saw in the slides. I fit the entire player class because that was brand new content. I wanted to make sure it was all there. What I didn't show the full thing of in the ooh, player main. Did I not call it player main? Object main? Oh boy. Oh, I, I created a test class. Uh, so I created a test suite to test my player. So I have my import. I created a brand new type, whether it's an object or a class, we import it. You've seen this in your pale blue dot testing. You import pale blue dot at the top. Import pbd dot pale blue dot. Same thing here. I need to import my player class if I want to work with it. Got my comparing. Never use equal equal to compare two doubles. 
And then to get into my testing, I'm going to create a new player with an X location, a Y location, and hit points. So I'm gonna create the initial values for these state variables. Where's their initial spawn location? This player is going to spawn at the origin, zero, zero. And what's their maximum hit points, which is never gonna change, which is 10 in this case. Then we're gonna create another player. They're at a different location in the map, at seven, negative four, but they also have 10 hit points. And then I can call a method. I can define and call methods that take player as a type. So print player location is one of those methods that I'm gonna define. Takes a player as a parameter, returns nothing. All I'm doing is using this to print things to the screen just to help me see what's going on. And to get an example of a method that takes a, a player that isn't too convoluted. And then prints the player's location to the screen with a little extra text to show me what's going on with this. I also have, so I don't have to scroll back up here, check player location. This is something I recommend as your testing gets more complicated, is writing helper methods in your test suite. So the first one is, I guess, a helper method, but it doesn't really help much with testing. But this one's gonna help with testing. I'm gonna take a player, my expected X and my expected Y. This is a, a method that's gonna test whether the player is at the location that I expect them to be, uh, to be at. So I expect them to be at XY. I'm gonna give the player in my expected XY, and then assert using my compare doubles, make sure the player, I'm gonna access its state, make sure the player's X location is close enough to that expected X, make sure the Y location is close enough to the expected Y, then my compare doubles is of course what we've seen before, comparing with epsilon, using a helper method so I don't have to you know, have this compare with epsilon all over my code. Now when I write my test cases, I can be a bit more focused. I can call check player location. I'm gonna move these players around and check their locations. It's doubles, so I have to use epsilon and all that stuff, you know, all this, but I created those two methods, and I'm just gonna keep calling those methods to really clean up my test cases. Check player location, player one, I expect them to be at zero, zero. So player one, zero, zero check the location, and then my asserts are going to be in that check player location method that we just saw. It's gonna make sure that we're close enough to zero, zero within truncation errors. I expect player two to be at seven, negative four. Nobody's moved yet. Then I'm gonna move player two and check to make sure that they're in that updated location. I'm gonna call player two's attack method, attack player one twice. Make sure player one's, we saw this in the slides. Make sure player two, or player one has two HP and is conscious. Deal the finishing blow, and make sure that they are not conscious anymore. And end my test. So let's run this. So I'm accessing the behavior, I'm calling the methods, and then checking the state. Make sure the state is what I expect it to be after those method calls. Oh yeah, pass this so we don't really get much feedback. I fail a test. Oops. So here's my print player location method. And my test failed right away. So I printed the player locations. That's what we see up here. and my next test before anything else was printed out failed in that case. But I did get some useful feedback. Once my test fails, I want whatever feedback I can get. So I printed some stuff to the screen to help me out. So the constructor, yeah, the constructor's whatever's inside. Whatever I put in here, this defines the constructor. The constructor is gonna do two things, set these initial values, and two, create these state variables. We're gonna have these three state variables. So inside our testing, like even though it kinda looks like we're never declaring x location, y location, max HP, 
Inside our testing, we can still access this, these state variables because the constructor declares those as state variables. Now we can add to this. Uh, name. We can add a name here. What this is going to do is break all my testing. So if we add another parameter here, when we go back to our testing, we're going to see that our code's broken because we have to provide all of the constructor parameters. We have to have, provide arguments that match all of the constructor parameters. So here I would have to add like player one, player two, and now everything's good again. Did I create another? Oh yeah, I created another player in my next test. So if we change the constructor, we have to have arguments to match. Whenever we say new player, we have to provide values for all of the constructor parameters. All right, any other questions? Ooh, we do have. Uh, so you can't put any extra code inside the constructor besides creating new variables, but we can put code, any code outside of all the methods will run after the constructor is called. So if once this, all the parameters are set from the constructor call, these two lines of code are going to execute. So you notice my HP here, I'm setting it equal to this dot max hit points. That's effectively code that ran in my constructor. It's a little bit different in, in Scala, uh, but it, it's effectively code that's running inside my constructor. So any initialization code that you want to run, put it outside of all of your methods, and that code will run whenever an object is created. In fact, we can hit the debugger, hit this with the debugger, and set a debugger, a breakpoint right here, go into debug, And the first thing this is going to do is jump to the constructor and run the constructor code. And the next thing it does is run any code that's outside of the methods after the constructor exits. So I can see that I have a player of this, which is a reference to the player that's being constructed, and then my x location, y location, max HP, HP, and damage dealt variables. And once we hit this, line, HP is now set to 10. So that's code that executed as the object's being created or constructed. So if you have any initialization code you want, put it outside all the methods. Can a constructor be overloaded to allow different parameter lists? N not, uh, so it's a little bit more, uh, more advanced. We can have default parameters like this, and then I can go back to my tests and remove my names. But we can't have proper overloading of the methods. That's where we would use uh, what's called the helper object with apply methods. That's actually what the list class is doing. That's why we don't need the keyword new. Uh, but that's not something we're going to touch in this class. Uh, with that, I'll see everyone Wednesday. We'll see more examples of this.